Hello everyone and welcome to DWeb Decoded, which some of you may remember uh, as doing a series of Twitter spaces talking to some of the uh, established and upcoming players in the decentralized web. Um, we called it Decentralist then. We decided to move into the bigger ecosystem of uh, podcasts. And then we discovered that there was an equally brilliant uh, podcast called The Decentralist. I'm not sure whether they got the name from the same place as I did, which is feeding it to GPT-3 um, uh, years ago. But uh, never mind, uh, namespace clashes are always a feature of any open system. So we're DWeb decoded now, but the principle remains the same. We're talking to some of the brilliant minds in what is a vast and sprawling uh, world of people working to re-decentralize the internet and really keep it decentralized too. Uh, with a little bit of a focus on uh, what I endlessly call the uh, Filecoin extended cinematic universe. I'm extremely excited to have one of the stars in that particular firmament with me today. Um, uh, that's Brooklyn Zelenka. Brooke, um, Brooke, hi, how are you doing? Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing, I'm doing okay. I cut myself shaving, so I'm a little bit obsessed with that because now we have like video. Maybe we can like edit it out or at the very least, um, uh, if you're viewing this, pay no attention to my lower nose. So Brooklyn is the co-founder and CTO of Fission, uh, all capital letters. And if you want to go and see the website, it's fission.code where her team is creating next generation tools to empower developers to easily build innovative and decentralized applications. She's an expert in programming language theory, uh, VMs and distributed systems, and was previously an active Ethereum core developer. I didn't know that. Focused on EVM optimization. Brooke has invented a number of protocols, which we'll be talking about, including UCAN, the distributed auth system, the WNFS encrypted content addressed file system, and more recently, the IPVM content addressed computation platform. But the actual question, the first question I really want to ask you is, are you any relation to Jan Zelenka, the composer? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not, um, though I get asked that question every time I go back to the Czech Republic where right. uh, my, my family's from. So yeah, and especially uh, because I studied music in university, you know, people are like, ah, oh, is there some connection? But no, uh, uh, Zelenka is just a very common Czech name. So. Uh, right, right, right. So, but this, this segues perfectly into kind of this open question is that your background is in musical theory. And then now you're pretty much established as a protocol designer and sort of high level thinker um, uh, in this space. How 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 does how did that that velocity kind of take you through both of those things? Uh, well, a, a long winding series of happy <laughs> accidents, I think, um, and uh, happy accidents also in that a lot of the background ends up being very similar. So I had I'll, I'll give you sort of like more of a uh, direct um, uh, path, and then kind kind of why it works out well. Um, so I was in music school, um, I ended up doing a lot of the posters and promotional materials for, um, for the other students for their concerts. And so I picked up Photoshop, Illustrator, and a bunch of these techniques. So I ended up working a little bit as a graphic designer on the side to pay the bills and ended up at a startup that said, okay, cool, like, you know, you can do graphic design, but like, you know, it would be really helpful if you could also implement some of this stuff on the front end, you know, we wear a lot of hats here, you know, here's some books on HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and at the time they were using a, a framework that, um, you know, uh, did any JVM um, language on the back end, so, you know, Closure Scala, et cetera, like, but maybe to start with the front end, you know, start with this. Yeah, yeah. So I read those over the weekend, came back on Monday and, you know, happily programming away. And they're like, uh, you seem better at this than you are at that. Like maybe, maybe stick with the programming. So, <laughs> um, but the, I think part of why um, that, that transition was so easy was a writing music is writing a bunch of instructions for a performer to execute. So you're already thinking about this in relatively, you know, uh, intricate systems. Right. And all of the math in higher music theory is 
pretty much the same. It's it's all matrices and graph theory and like just a little bit of category theory. So Interesting. a lot of the, you know, the prereqs are the same, it turns out. This category theory and music theory? Yeah. Wow, that's really So do you do you feel that you uh this was the the question that I wrote down and then I went what would I feel like if somebody asked me, which is like, do you feel like you're using the same part of your brain when you're doing these things? Um, and I thought about it in terms of writing, right? Writing and programming. And I was like, I, it does kind of feel like a complex system. Um, is it, is it, does it feel the same? Does it feel yeah. the same as graphic design as well? I mean, is it, was that like a completely different part yeah. of you doing it you know I, I would actually say graphic design was like yes there's the creative aspect but it it used a different part of my brain i yeah. i often say like uh writing music and writing code sort of scratches the same part of my brain right, right. and uh you know i really fell in love with programming both because uh the way you think is similar but uh you can do like in, in no way to say that, you know, writing music isn't, isn't valuable. Absolutely it is, right? But uh, you can do things that then lots of other people can take and extend and work on. And there's almost more of a social aspect as opposed to just performance. Um, and getting that same sort of, you know, dopamine high off of, um, uh, off of writing code as writing music, plus all these additional benefits was, yeah, just just. Uh, really lovely. So I unfortunately these days don't have as much time to write music as I used to, but um, uh, you know, I, I still get the same, um, uh, uh, you know, work the same parts of my brain. Same cheap kick. Yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> which, which has the better tooling after the hundreds of years of music design? Uh, shockingly still, um, uh, so tooling, programming for sure. Um, methods of teaching and, and pedagogy definitely right. music yeah right right yeah. that's sort of i always again because my you know other half of my brain is writing i'm always like the project of successfully teaching over 80 percent of the population literacy is sort of i feel like it's not a kind of a, you know learn to code kind of thing i'm just like that is an understated like victory right like we've taken something incredibly complicated and clearly the role of you know held by a tiny minority of people who presumed that they were the only people smart enough to do it and turned it into a universal skill um and music music i mean music has that nice sort of aspiration to that even if like we don't give it the resources that perhaps would make that succeed um but programming we have no idea oh beginning okay okay i'm getting off track so i will bring it back because the first i, I kind of want to talk about fission because i fission was one of the first when i was sort of wandering around filecoin adjacent things fission were, blew me away right like I, I i was like going okay let's find all these little companies and what they're doing and my first experience of it was in fact what became WNFS, I think now, um, because you had a sort of, you had the fish and drive. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who haven't played around with this tech, um, in, in, in Falcon and IPFS, people are often like, oh, what we need is a Dropbox. And, um, and it, I went and I went, this is actually better than, than Dropbox. Like I authenticated with it and I was like, wait, how did that happen? Like now I'm able to duplicate this on all of my devices. And I didn't even realize that I was creating an account. It was, it was beautiful and it had private and public sort of sourcing, right? So something you could put something in one folder and everyone would be able to see it. Um, and you could put something else and it would be encrypted and it would just for, be for me, but shared across all these devices. Well, Dropbox used to have the public thing by default. And I think they stopped that because everybody was creating websites on it. Um, 
Uh, but but of course with IPFS, you know, and that's one of the possibilities is you could do this, and if if it became popular, you could just shut it. So anyway, I, I tell me what how that started and and what it's become now with WNFS. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Fission started in 2019, essentially saying, um, you know, take, taking the experiences that my co-founder Boris and I had um, in the Ethereum ecosystem and saying, these are some cool techniques. What if we apply these to the problems that all developers have, not just people in the blockchain space? Right. Um, and Fission Drive was one of the first things that we built. Um, so we knew that uh, we wanted content addressing. We wanted to be able to do things, you know, where you um, your local um, uh, instance of a, of a website or an app or of files was equally valid as something that was living on a server, right? Um, and so we figured out, you know, we'll, we'll throw together a little file explorer. Um, and Stephen uh, on on the Fission team uh, has an eye for design and, and made this really beautiful uh, experience. Um, and we didn't really think uh, too, too much of it. And then people keep, keep discovering it and, and finding more. Um, in those early days, the idea was essentially to be uh, almost like a, a new version of Heroku, like an app deployment platform. And in fact, right. the thing you're saying that people are hosting websites or were hosting websites on the public portion of Dropbox is, was the thing that we explicitly wanted to do. It's like, okay, you can host your website in, um, on IPFS, and then you know we'll do some extra magic so that you can uh, make the data update over time and uh, you know have it still uh, you know work offline. And in addition to just raw IPFS, we also need private data because you know as great as it is to host a website, you often want people to not see all of your files and all of your notes and, and you know your photos, etc. Um, so uh, WinFS, WNFS, we seem to shorten it to, to WinFS. Um, is uh, one way of thinking of it is um, IPFS plus encryption um, plus multi-writer support. There's a few other features in there as well, but it's basically, if you want to use this for real application use, these are the, the base layer of features that you would need. And so we added those um, uh, in addition. When we started working on this stack, we knew we always wanted to get to having the ability to compute on data and to do computation, you need to have a data layer, including private data and, and access controlled data. And in order to do that, you need a general auth layer. And so we, it wasn't quite as straight a line as, as being described here, but uh, we knew that we needed um, uh, auth, so we did UCAN. So you can at the bottom, WinFS in the middle, we're actually building a, a distributed database also that uh, persists into WinFS and then on top, uh, Past few months, we started working on uh, the interplanetary virtual machine IPVM, uh, which uh, takes content-addressed computation and adds it to IPFS. So, as I'm going through like these little treasure chests as I wander around, like the RPG of of, of, the, of the Filecoin network, I um like UCAM was the next one, and that was when I got very like slightly overexcited. To be honest, I think I just like randomly pinged your colleague Boris and was like, "What is this?" Because UCAN is a capability based authority system. And people who listen to this podcast before know that I am a member of the capability cult, right? Like it's for me, uh, I mean, not, not really me, but like, you know, when I was doing my initial research, anybody I met who was smarter than me, much smarter than me, would go, well, the thing we need is a capability-based, you know, authorization system. Um, so at the, at the foundation, I was like, okay, this is what we need to find and support. And then the next week I stumbled on UCAN, which again is like another, like another part of this puzzle. Um, I always challenge anybody in the OCAP capability space to explain it because we're only, it's, it's a hard one, right? It's like quantum computing or something, but like we've spent decades trying to explain this to people. Okay, so your turn. How do you explain UCAN to somebody who's just coming into this space? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll tell you about UCAN and, and then I'll, I'll take a crack at capability-based auth systems right. sort of broadly. So uh, UCAN 
for those familiar with OAuth, it's similar to OAuth. So it uses this uh, token format called JWT that's built into basically every, you know, all the tooling, right? Um, and it lets you describe what a user is allowed to do um, and in a way that is not tied to a particular server. So uh, UCAN uh, is an acronym for User Controlled Authorization Network. And so it lets me create, for example, a WinFS or um, you know, uh, a chunk of time on my processor, on my computer, or you know, uh, the ability to send email, literally anything, and say, you know what, I want to delegate to you the ability to send email on my behalf for the next three days, let's say. Right. Or I want to give you right access to this particular directory. And now it doesn't depend on that living in any particular place or dialing into a particular server, which leads to centralization. Auth is a major component of centralization. Right. Um, it lets the auth travel around with the data itself and, and move any, anywhere. So uh, capability-based systems. Most people are familiar with uh, what are called access control lists, ACLs. Uh, and essentially it's uh, a list of who's allowed to do what. So the, the analogy for this is it's like a bouncer at a club. And you know you go and you're like, hey, I, I'd like to be let in. And they look at the list and they're like, are you on the cool person list, yes or no? And if you want to update that, you have to go and talk to the bouncer and be like, hey, actually, they are allowed in, right? Or uh, no, they're not allowed in anymore, right? And, and write this down. The uh, capability method is often described as uh, keys or like tickets. So. Uh, later today, uh, I'm going to go see the Barbie movie, and all, they don't care to see my ID. They don't care who I am. They care that I have a valid ticket that they can scan and go in. And if I can't make it, I could give the ticket to Boris, and he'd go in my stead. Right. right. And that's uh, the direction of the relationship is is backwards now because it's no longer about who you are. It's about what you can do, and the authorization travels around with the holder of that thing. So in, in UCAN, there's a little bit of extra cryptographic magic that makes this additionally secure in addition to these, um, uh, you know, how, how the thing, the authority flows through the system. But the main thing to note is in a capability-based system, um, they, like tickets, they can travel around. You can make copies of your ticket. We're stretching the metaphor a little bit, hand them out to other people rather than having to go to some central list and update everything in one place. Right. The downside, uh, so there's a couple different ways of doing capability-based systems. Um, they can express everything that ACLs can, plus more. Um, the downside is that you can't necessarily get a complete picture of absolutely everything. You can say, like, well, here's who I delegated things to, right. and I'm allowed to see that part of the system. I can't see the entire world because, you know, maybe somebody's using it offline, maybe... Because it's um, decentralized, right? It's, it's decentralized, yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, exactly. So how did I do? Was that... Uh, that uh, was So that's the best kind of analogy because it actually made me think of a practical occasion where this happened. So um, <laughs> I'm always like doing these name dropping things, right? So so um, we were, we had a Filecoin event um, and it was it sort of had an after party and someone messaged going, Jimmy Wales the founder of Wikipedia is in town and we were like, Oh shit, we should get him. Like we should like get, let him go into our party. And we couldn't get to the bouncer to tell them. So it was endless complexity, very kind of embarrassing kind of moment of like, is the bouncer going to throw out Jimmy Wales or whatever. And at the same time, like people were getting into the party by kind of just convincing the bouncer that they were the person who they said they were. And I'm sitting there going, God, if only we had like a capability thing, we could have really easily minted Jimmy Wales with like a little QR code or something. And like it would be much harder because you're leaning on what your strengths are in a decentralized system, right? Like we have super strong cryptographic proofs that we can do but we have but but we we have no sort of central trustable authority and our the argument is is that neither does anyone else right like if you if you go okay our trustable authority is that like we're going to keep the list 
ultimately means that you're trusting the bouncer and bouncers are really nice people. I want to be let into clubs in the future. But that's a single point of failure, right? Like own the bouncer, own the entire uh, uh, entire system. So good. I'm going to use I'll, uh, I'm, I'll, I may have to change him to be some like analog to to a famous person. But okay, so we got to UCANs. So basically, now you have something that is like Dropbox, but more, right? Because you can start passing this stuff around, and and I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about this because I think it's 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 significant in the like you're not building Dropbox actually right these are just kind of demos of a protocol of a of a of a standard right and in fact the place that I see you can being used most visibly right now is in a separate project in the Falcon Extended Cinematic Universe which is Web three storage. Um, and so they picked it up, and now you can do stuff with Web3 storage, which is basically kind of like a, a thing that lets you upload data to Filecoin and then share it over, over IPFS. People use it for NFTs and this kind of thing. Um, but, but, but now you can do this like crazy super OAuth delegation where you can go, actually, I'm going to let you... I'll, I'll pay for this, but you can upload to this bit of it or this email address, or we can share it. Um, did you, is, is, have, have you reached the point where this is all kind of super compatible? And like, if somebody is doing something on web three storage, they can do something elsewhere. And is that a useful thing to do? Or do these things end up kind of just being like proprietary to their own systems, but we're all learning the same stuff and, you know, f fixing the same bugs, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of the major benefits of having the auth travel around with your requests directly is anybody who's using UCAN automatically interoperates. So okay. that might be mainly happening, you know, so uh, has... Fission and uh, Web3 Storage done a direct integration on our backends? No. But you could do uh, on the front end, say, ah, I want Fission to update the DNS, and I want um, Daghouse to update the data, and actually I, I want Daghouse of Daghouse so are the people, the people uh, who make Web3 Storage. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, but uh, because all that it cares about is, you know, is there... Uh, access to a particular resource, right? It doesn't care, do you have an account with us? All they care is about is that, you know, as we delegate between users, um, were you delegated access to this volume of storage or this DNS record or whatever the thing is? Um, and in fact, we've talked with a, a bunch of teams in the ecosystem about also then doing this on the back end. So you can imagine something where, you know, uh, Fission runs our own uh, domain name servers, right? So you want to update... Um, a website to the latest, uh, you know, CID, for example. You could upload data to another provider, say Daghouse, and they could then turn around and update the domain name that's hosted oh. Fission automatically without us having to know that anything special is happening. Right. Without having to make these two requests. Um, and so as soon as you, like, without having to do pre-negotiation is, is when we, we, we normally say it. So... Um, you can make these kinds of relationships with traditional systems like OAuth, but you have to pre-provision the relationship. And in a UCAN system, it doesn't care. You can just show up and be like, I have a valid UCAN. Please do the thing for me. Right, right. So I've definitely sort of hit something similar where I'm footsaling around with so you have um, immutable data that you can put on IPFS, but the in order to sort of have something like a website where you can go go to this CID and the website will be there and it will be the latest version of the website. You do this thing called IPNS, which is kind of a pointer to immutable data that can change. And I'm always like, okay, so I have a private key that, that lets me update that pointer. Uh, like, I don't want to be the person kind of, I mean, I kind of want to keep the key because that's the key to everything, like uh, owning the domain name. 
but I want other people to be it. I don't want to bother doing this like locally. Um, is that what it, is that what it gives you? Is that? Yeah. Um, so IPNS, I'll, I'll sort of pull it apart in, into two halves yeah. for, um, there's sort of what I would call like true IPNS that's built into clients like, uh, Kubo where you can publish records over time and it's just associated with your public key and you know that the updates are correct because you can sign them. The other side and it's actually technically DNS link, but people often mm -hmm. complete the two because it's this, you know, mutable pointer yeah. idea to say like, I'm gonna like, you know, CIDs are immutable, you can't change them, but we can update this pointer over time. Right. right. Um, and so that's putting a record in DNS. And so then if you have this in the correct record and you go to, you know, example.com, it'll serve the website that sits behind that CID. Um, DNS link, um, you need to basically uh, run a server that manages those DNS updates, right. you know, a bit of a headache, and, uh, or use a managed service. Um, uh, IPNS is nice because, uh, you know, the version in Kubo is nice because you can do this yourself, but it's just one key. So right. there's been um, a number of proposals to add UCAN to IPNS to basically say, I delegate you the right to update stuff in my namespace. Right. Um, so in, in fact, the um, Web3 storage folks have a uh, sort of a, a shim uh, proposal uh, where you could um, basically uh, wrap a service around a Kubo node that knows, oh, okay, yeah, I can check the UCAN chain. And then, you know, we don't actually have to change anything about IPNS. And then there are more... Um, uh, we'll say uh, extreme upgrades uh, that use that actually gossip the UCANs around to the entire network, so that you can make these updates without having to republish all the time and without having to um, uh, check for the particular signature. As long as you can trace it back to the root of this UCAN chain, you're all good. Um, right. Something uh, Blaine on the Fission team has been uh, working on specs for and has a proof of concept um, in the code that, you know, we're in, in the towering stack of things that we're working on. We really <laughs> want to get, get to this one, but um, something uh, he calls uh, the name name system uh -huh. uh, or an NNS. And uh, it's essentially taking this in, even further and saying, well, instead of putting it at your public key, which is not friendly, it's not human readable. What if you could root that in your email address or in your website or, you know, really anywhere? And then have IPNS running underneath that. So you could say, hey, check out uh, you know, this file. It's at my email address slash you know, vacation photos. And actually have that resolve. And this is Blaine Cook, who yes. I should grab to be on the program, because he was one of the first employees at Twitter, thinking about the decentralizing of Twitter you know, at its very inception. And was he involved in the design of, was it OAuth? Or? Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so this sort of br brings me back, like I, I was have my mechanical keyboard clicking a little bit there because I was going back to the Fish and Codes website um, because you sort of describe like you're building all of these things independently, but there's this reference to a sort of a, a dense ecosystem of like-minded projects, which is accurate right <laughs> like you have web3 storage you have like other people using you can you have sort of everybody operating in this space where they're you know it's protocols not platforms right like and and you're one of the people building these protocols i mean I, I can't ask the dumb question of what is this like but from like it, have have you previously had experience when you're actually building kind of we're shipping some actual software that is hours and hours alone um, so we can use any old hack to get it to work as long as it works versus I am trying to build something that we can use but is also generalizable so other people can use it so that actually we will all succeed simultaneously. What how has that changed how you, you, you work? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's a good question. Um, so I would say in a lot of ways, this feels more like doing classic open source work, right? Open source right. standards is, is 
in, in a lot of ways what we're doing in like, yes, Vision's building you know, a platform and we're gonna monetize it and you know, all of this stuff, but the, the core protocol work, you know, we uh, showed up in you know, a little over four years ago and we're like, ah, oh, surely everybody has all this stuff figured out already. And then we right. discovered it's gonna be us that figures this out, right? Um, and not being, you know, the, the historically, um, it's been a winner takes all, you know, close off, super secretive, you know, you can't show people stuff, right? And by taking the opposite approach, and in fact, we've broken out, you know, you can, sure, it started as part of Vision's products. We're like, ah, this seems generally useful. Maybe other people could use it. And we created the You Can Working Group GitHub org, and we have community calls, and we've gotten people from other organizations involved in writing the specs. And, you know, this isn't a purely Fission project anymore. It's a community project, right? And it's right. owned by the community. So uh, just using You Can as, you know, one example, uh, the four authors um, on the the main delegation spec are myself and Philip, who are at Fission, um, Daniel Holmgren, who's at Blue Sky, and uh, oh, Rackley right. at uh, Web3 Storage. Right. And, uh, you know, different specs have different authors on them. Um, a lot of different teams are using these things. Um, Fission, uh, this year, switching our entire tech stack over to Rust. Um, and we're now using the RSU can crate that we didn't write, right? right. So it's like it right. has these these additional benefits of like, oh, okay, not only are we getting feedback from people about how these things work, but like, you know, it's it's actual open source. We're actually interacting with these things, um, and having a uh, you know, we have this longer vision. Sometimes Forrest calls this you know the the ten year vision of vision, and. Um, Instead of saying, well, we're going to weld the whole thing together, making things so that they can be broken out individually um, and composed into this, you know, nice stack that we see, but like, well, why should we limit ourselves to, you know, the way that we see stuff? So IPVM really focused on deterministic web assembly, but it has all of the underlying components that you would need to build something like Bacalyao, right? So Which is the compute of a uh, um, file coin um, sort of. Uh, kind of docker for, for file going data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. It, it, exactly. Carry on. And so we said, well, instead of being competitive with them, what if we got them involved? And what if we could see what we can learn from each other and how we can work on this stuff together? So it's actually, you can at the bottom layer, and above it, we put all the IPVM specs, but now that's mainly in collaboration with folks like Bacalyao. Um, Interesting, because yeah. I do... I mean, we'll talk about IPVM a little bit in a, in, in, a, in a bit, but yeah, I mean, when I look at these things, I'm kind of like, oh, these occupy kind of the same, roughly in the same area, and they have differences, but which one do I use? Um, and if they work together, then that makes, that makes that decision a lot less a kind of dependency, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, you know, one, one way of thinking about this, right, uh, there's two sides. One is all of this stuff is so early that to even be in the space at all, you have to make a bet on the fact that this is going to grow, right? Um, and so we're not fighting over a finite size, you know, pie. It's that the pie is going to grow over time and we're all going to benefit from working together. And right. secondly, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just use Bacalyao again as, as an example because the most recent one, they're not like you have a slightly different way of, of approaching problems, et cetera, but like, uh, they're, they're not our competition. Amazon's right. our competition. Right. right, right. Lambda's the competition. And the, if you take the entire decentralized space together, it's like a fraction of a fraction of a percent um, of the size and, you know, just rolling weight of something like AWS. Right. And so it's, only in everyone's best interest to link arms and say like, hey, we're going to go in and take on, you know, Goliath here, right? Yeah, I really, I really like your phrase classic open source, because I think one of the things that I, I often because, you know, people open source is like air now, and like everybody just just inhabits a world where they have uh, open source tooling. And, you know, you're not lo no longer largely in 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 most of the space that people know about on the web. You're not in this situation where you have to like argue really hard <laughs> like to to open source your data. But 
the um, the economics have slightly changed, or the the kind of reputation economics have kind of changed. In the the now people tend to use very like large open source projects that are incubated in these big companies and then sort of thrown over the transom, right? Like, oh, we made this thing Kubernetes catch, um, and I mean the. the I mean, don't get me wrong, like that's an amazing public good to have like this, this, this incredible software. But um, uh, the, I think that it's less familiar, people are less familiar with this other thing that, that used to happen much more, which is that people would build something, say, uh, Ruby on Rails, and it would it would act as a thing that would lift up an entire set of people while giving them some practical independence at, at the same time. Like you, and you know, often these ecosystems can re-centralize up, but WordPress, Linux, Ruby on Rails, right? You get this whole ecosystem type. Docker, actually, thinking about it, maybe Docker's the, the last time I really saw that. Uh, where there's like a company in the middle, there's, you know, it's not, it's not completely balanced out, but you get a sense that, oh, the more I contribute into this, the more my skills become relevant and the more we have like a firm, a firm underpinning. Yeah, that's really, oh, that's interesting. So part of that is being open and transparent, right? Because people need to know where you are in the process even if something isn't fully baked they need to go oh is the thing that you're cooking kind of going to match with our um our approach and and it's no mistake that the fishing was one of the things that was most easy for me to find in this ecosystem right you have a discord you have these community calls every month um you're I get the sense that your internal structure is is also kind of has that for, right you're like you're connecting with these these external transparency systems fairly easily rather than okay we have to like you know put out a press release or whatever how much where did the thinking come from to build the the, the way that you work um uh in that way yeah um so some of it is just uh the founder dna right for, for the company so um uh, i have a long history in in open source and, and standards um and we'd seen some of the things that worked and things that didn't uh over in the ethereum ecosystem and uh, i can't credit boris my, my co-founder enough with these things he has even longer history um, you know, going back to the early 2000s in Drupal, um, running the Ethereum Magicians community, um, you know, uh, organizing Ethereum Core Dev um, meetings, like, you know, all of these things. So it was really core to the way that uh, Boris and I worked for a long time. And, uh, you know, especially when we were much smaller, not to say that we're large now, we're still, you know, 20 or so people, but, you know, when we were three people, um, these problems are really hard, right? And being a more permeable organization um, gets you access to more minds on the problem and the way to, you know, look at problems from a different angle and, uh, you know, access to um, interacting with people that are otherwise um, in other organizations. You literally can't even hire, right? So right. Um, the collaboration that uh, I've now had for a few years with Arakli has been just at, at Web3 Storage has been fantastic, super brilliant guy, literally wouldn't be able to hire him, right? And so um, being able to, to do things that way, um, we are, you know, I mentioned this idea of a permeable organization. We have a lot of collaborators and, and other teams um, that we work pretty closely with. So um, Banyan Computer and uh, Number Zero, who are also in, in sort of the, the extended cinematic universe, as, as you call it, um, you know, using tools like Discord lets us, unlike something like Slack, where it's like everybody's in, or like maybe you have a shared channel, um, because Discord comes out of video games, which you need content moderation and the, you know these controls, right. um, makes it and really easy. And fast co-op, right? So, yeah. 
Yeah, it makes it really easy for us to say like, well, you're allowed in, you know, to see, you know, like, we'll create a section just for these people and these collaborators on these projects and, you know, um, encouraging our team to actually just go and reach out and talk to people. Uh, the hardest problem that we have really in, in this is people are often deeply suspicious of like, what's our angle, right? Are we going to, to rug pull them at some point in the future? Right. Um, and having to, the, the main thing that we had to learn on, on that side, other than being, you know, um, uh, just generally friendly people, <laughs> right, and building trust, um, is getting really clear about the intellectual property releases and, you know, licensing and, and that stuff. And licensing is not a cool, you know, hey, look, I shipped a new feature thing, but uh, the innovation of licensing is, is really important for collaboration. Right. Right. Again, like some of the first conversations I had with you folks was sort of actually on the licensing stuff, because, again, my background is is sort of in open source. And, you know, it's one of those things where everybody goes, well, this is kind of sorted. And you go, believe me, it was like five years ago that we like we even vaguely had an idea of what we were doing. And it's it, this is like a brief pause before the you know, the chaos of like AI or ethical licenses or things like that will keep things going again. I, so I have, this is a completely off, off the, um, uh, off the side kind of question, but like why we always discord. So why haven't we built like a decentralized thing that is as good as discord that we all suddenly, you know, switch to, um, what, like, why can't we do that? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, um, I, th I think it's possible. A lot of the tech is still just so early, right? Yeah. So the traditional architecture to build a web application, right, you know, um, has existed since the 90s. You know, you, you run a central server, your main problem is scaling that up. Um, you know, Discord, fantastic experience most of the time. Sometimes I can't read messages for 10 minutes, right? Because there's just like so, so much scale. Um, and the um, uh, the trade-offs are totally flipped with decentralized tech, right? It's, you get scale for free, right? You only need to connect to the people that you're actually talking to, right? It's right. great. Um, but getting a global view, discovering new things, harder, and you need to build systems for that. The underlying technologies are I wouldn't even necessarily say that they're harder, they're just newer. We, we haven't had the millions of person hours put into it yet to make the to make it really smooth versus the LAMP stack, which has been around since you know the, the mid 90s. Yeah. Um, and a lot of the tech that we're working on at Vision is literally to enable these things. So could we build a Discord-like experience with something like Matrix? Yeah, pr probably. Um, you know, we were using matrix-like things uh, five, six years ago, and the experience was still really not there. Yeah. And it's a lot better now, right? So somebody has to come along and build, you know, a UI and an account system and all of these things around that. Um, that makes it easier. Um, but a lot of the underlying, you know, how do you do DMs in a decentralized way? Well, you need encryption. Which encryption? There's a lot of choices to be made. So a lot of the, the stack that we're building at Fission is to solve these kinds of questions, right? Like, should we be able to build a blue sky PDS that involves DMs that are end-to-end -end encrypted? Just What's a PDS? In uh, sorry, a uh, personal data store. Uh, so blue sky, the um, decentralized, uh, often described as a decentralized Twitter, yeah. um, is uh, building a protocol as well as the product at the same time and uh when there's more than one provider today there's just the one right but when there are multiple providers uh you'll need to store your data somewhere so they call that a personal data store who's actually hosting your data right 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 so like tim uh berners lee sort of solid this idea that like you have all your data but you can move it from from whoever you want yeah, Interesting. exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, one of the things, so Solid's sort of interesting. Um, you know, do I think that your average consumer understands the concept of a solid pod and that, you know, oh, I'm going to buy storage here and, you know, it'll have all of my app data in it. Um, I think that'll get abstracted away by developers, but we can go even further decentralized and say, 
you know, solid still says, this is where the data lives in this place. And then like you could pick that up and move it around. A lot of decentralized tech and just getting started with some of this stuff, right? You know, local first and, and, and whatnot, uh, which is another related, um, uh, you know, part of the zeitgeist um, says, well, what if there isn't a single site for data? What if your data, the data that you have on your laptop while you're on a plane with no Wi-Fi, why isn't that considered real use? Absolutely, it's real use, right? Why can't I replicate my data on iCloud and on in a solid pod, right? Mm -hmm. And have them know and interact with each other. And so, again, a lot of the stuff that we're working on from UCAN through WinFS through IPVM is this like, well, what if there weren't boundaries? between things? And what if you could self-host without having to run a server? What if your browser was self-hosting? Yeah, I feel like one of the, it's sort of one of the tests that one of the reasons why things centralized up is people went, God, I don't want to run my own server to use Moxie Marlin Spikes line, or I don't want to like deal with this low level stuff. I just want that abstracted away. And the question, you know, again, having worked or seen people work in big organizations, you're going, you that is in no way abstract <laughs> like there's still going on somebody's still having to solve those problems um uh and you still get occasionally the disasters that come from like not having solved those problems effectively we need to solve those pro problems in an open way and slowly slowly abstract and like give you a toolkit so You've mentioned a few times that the latest thing, that bit of this toolkit that you're working on is um, is IPVM. Um, so is that IP as in interplanetary, like as in IPFS? Great. Um, and I just want to throw in case we run out of time or whatever, you're going to be speaking on about this at um, Strange Loop in September 21st, I think. Um, so... With the preface that, like, I imagine it's even deeper than we can cover here. Let's go and listen to that. Um, what is IP IP uh, VM? Yeah. Um, so IP VM uh, IPFS is obviously for data, right? And content addressing gives you the ability to say, well, I don't care where the data lives. Go find it for me. And everything is immutable, and it has cryptographic proofs, and you can trust that you're getting the right data. IPVM says, well, what if we took that and extended it also to compute, right? Um, now, now we, just in the past few years, have a few new pieces that we can work with, right? So one is WebAssembly, which is, uh, you know, when you're building a, um, an app for the browser, um, you program it in JavaScript, and now, more recently, WebAssembly, which is like a lower level um, uh, instruction set. So you can basically compile down to a binary and, and ship that into the browser. And it compiles from uh, 40 plus languages today, and you know they're onboarding new ones all the time. And it has this nice property where you can flip the right switches on it, and you get completely deterministic um, execution out the other mm -hmm. side. So in the same way that I get some data, I run a hash, and I check that the content address is the same, we can check, OK, were these two runs the same? And do I get the same result every time, which is actually historically has been a really difficult problem. This isn't something you can do by, you know, compiling just arbitrary code and stick, shoving it in a Docker container and, you know, you might get right. a different result every time, right? Um, it's very, you know, WebAssembly now runs in every browser, it runs on servers, it runs on desktop, it's just kind of everywhere, right? Um, and it's still early days, but uh, it's at least runs all over the place and the tooling is getting better all the time. So we said, well, okay, we have the same sort of determinism guarantees. What if we took, instead of content addressing, we had input addressing, and we built workflows out of them. So um, if I have a workflow that's like, you know, uh, grab this photo off of IPFS, um, grayscale it, crop it in this way, and uh, then write it into Filecoin, right? Like that's a pretty typical workflow. Um, I can get back receipts from each step of that. So everything in there is totally deterministic. If I run it again, I get the same results. If I crash halfway through, I don't have to start from the beginning. I can go to right. which step I was in and continue from there. And if somebody else wanted to, I can't remember the exact sequence I just described, but you know, grab that same image, 
right. uh, what was it, grayscale it, crop it, and then do something else with it, they don't have to run all of the compute again. They can just pick up from wherever the difference is right. um, and, and move on. Um, and in the same way that, so one way of looking at this is almost like smart contracts, right? Except without consensus. Most things you compute don't require consensus. Right. Only need consensus when you have uh, some kind of scarcity, right? You have money or you, know, you need to prove that somebody owns the NFT or something like that. Most other things don't need to wait for things to execute in absolute lockstep, right? The only people who care about me grayscaling the image are like, I don't know, me and my friends, right? So IPVM basically says, hey, you know, I'm on a low powered Android device. I could run this locally, but you know, I would like this to run faster. Who has some spare compute cycles? And another device will say, hey, I'm on the network too. I can do that for you because every device can run WebAssembly. Um, and maybe they're going to do it altruistically because it's your, you know, your desktop at home. Or maybe it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it for, you know, this bid price. And, you know, off it goes. So it's a little bit like AWS Lambda, but decentralized. Hmm. Um, and so that, that was the initial idea for it. And there's, you know, some other benefits around, um, you know, uh, error handling and stuff. So you don't have to worry about it. But. You know, that's getting more into the strange loop talk. Um, the um, once you have that in place, you want to be able to also do things at the end, like send an email, send an HTTP, HTTP request, um, uh, write it into Filecoin, send something to a smart contract, right? And so we're building it in a way that we're calling the the open world architecture, where uh, using UCAN underneath to tie all the services together, uh, you can do deterministic compu computation on any, de any device in the world. But if you need to run something, let's say, with a GPU, well, we now know that this group of computers have GPUs, they're willing to take jobs for you, and you can send it off to them and get mm -hmm. results back. Um, so we're still at the point where we're working on the fully deterministic WASM-only stuff. But where we're right. going with this is, you know, you should be able to start a, um, a flow directly from the browser, without any extra hosting, no setting up a server, nothing like that, have it you know, run a few steps and then go, ah, oh, actually, I need to send something into a FVM uh, contract. Have it do some computation there, send you back a result. Oh, I need this to run um, a chat GPT, or I, I guess just a, a, you know, a GPT uh, job. OK, well, actually, that is a really great fit for Bacalyao. It can then go into Bacalyao and come back, right? And it doesn't have to go back, you know, into the same device all the time, you know, uh, for um, uh, always having to go out to a, a web server is a lot of time and latency. And so saying, well, you know, I, I actually need to compute over a terabyte of data that lives on this Filecoin node. I'm gonna right. send the request to them and they can do all the steps that they need to and send it back to me because now it doesn't depend on any particular location for the compute yeah. to happen. I get proofs at the end, everything's deterministic, I can spot check them, you know, et cetera. Yeah. I feel like the story, the story of a lot of the stuff that folks are building out is that some of it is kind of exposing the guts of of what's been developed in centralized systems where you're going, obviously they have like all of this often, you know, pretty distributed and decentralized because it's the only way to have it work, kind of resource allocation systems internally to their systems. And so you have to recreate that part of it. Um, but then you get this bonus stuff for free, right? Which, you know, lets you do more complicated things because you're back in the open world, right? You're back in like, literally you can connect to anything and do anything in that broader kind of bazaar rather than having to wait for Amazon to recreate that or think that that is something that is worth them doing. Huh? So, yeah. um, so you, you, so you're wor working, so, uh, okay, so we've got like this stack appearing now of UCAN, IPVM, uh, uh, WinFS, and I mean, again, not just you, but like, you know, there's things like OCAPN going on, there's all the standards around um, IPFS itself, P 2 p and so forth. So what's sort of interesting about this is that the, how is there's not really a huge amount of connection yet between that and 
the external standards world, right? Like these aren't going through the IETF. They're not going through the W3C. Um, do you, or even, um, you know, uh, the more sort of ad hoc ones like what, what WG. Um, is that a benefit right now that like you're being a little bit more sort of, you know, let's, let's explore the space. Do you anticipate those things becoming more traditional standards? Yeah. Um, so about a uh, year and a half ago, two years ago, um, I had this moment of, oh no, I need to put this in a regular standards <laughs> body because who's going to hold the IP, right? Oh, um, right. Yeah. Always yeah. kind of tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, asked around and talked to a bunch of people who had done standards, you know, and, and uh, you know, worked on XML or like the, the standard, right? Or worked on, you know, OAuth or, you know, what, whatever the standard is. And overwhelmingly the answer back was like, how many people are using this today? Is it less than 100,000? You know, how many companies are using it? Less than 100,000? Cool, don't worry about it. Hmm. Make sure that the IP is, um, is clean, right? Right. Um, do all the IP releases have a... Um, uh, uh, essentially, all of the uh, contributors sign saying like, "Yes, I released this into the public domain." You know, all, all of this stuff, right? Which is different from an open source license, right? sure. You know, and patents um, too, right? You have to try and like navigate patents too. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah absolutely. In, in fact, uh, part of the paperwork, we use something called the um, Open Standards License. Um, uh, no. Open standards. Uh, I can't remember the, the last part of it, but make a um, make a, a, a mutable reference to it, and then we'll stick it in the notes. Yes, so, yeah. <laughs> sounds okay. good. Um, and uh, when you're signing off, saying like, "Yep, I I, I allow this," um, it includes like, "Do you have any patents?" Because we need to know about those, right? right. Um, so in order to keep things like really nimble and you know update things, and in fact, you know, you can currently is at uh, version zero point ten. We're moving towards a 1.0, like, I, I mean, it's a sort of open secret. The 0 0.10 is sort of like the 1.0 RC. We're just making sure that there's nothing like funky in the format or something like that. But that's quite a few versions. So we were doing, you know, a couple of versions a year for a while. And that's, um, uh, you know, at, at a relatively high rate of pace. What you get in the big standards orgs is lots of voices, which is great, but it does slow the process down. Right? And so like we still need to move really, really quickly right now. We need to make sure that we're, you know, the standards are meeting people's needs, that we're not going to have somebody need to like fork the thing so that it meets their their need. They can just show up on a community call and we can be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Let's put it in the standard, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, and sort of done. Um, so we we've done all of the sort of hygiene around this so that five years from now, we could take it to the wherever, the IETF and say, hey. This is in wide use. We need to, to actually make this like really solid. Um, you know, can you you know help facilitate that process? And can we get an RFC number for it? You know, all, all of these things. Right. Yeah. Cool. So we are still uh, in the exciting bit where like you know anybody can join, and there's a lot to be explored and fixed and and learned in this space. Um, What's the best way if people want to find out more and participate uh, with, with, let's go, you can, uh, WinFS and uh, uh, IPFS, uh, uh, sorry, IPVM. Um, so a couple of ways. Uh, one is uh, join the Fission Discord, always easy. Um, and uh, our website also has links out to all the, the various projects. Um, you can is the thing that's the furthest along. It has its own Discord, even. Um, so you can find that in, in the Discord directory um, or on youcan.xyz. Uh, it has a, a link to it as well. Um, all of these uh, things that we've broken out um, follow the pattern as GitHub orgs, so github.com slash can wg or IPVM-WG or WinFS.WG. Uh, they're all four letters, uh, dash WG, basically. Um, makes it really nice when you write them down as bullet points. Um, <laughs> uh, 
and to just show up and get involved in this in the discussion directly. Um, if anything, I would say, you know, people often come in and they're worried about stepping on toes or like, ah, oh, you know, like, can I contribute, you know, a whatever, uh, a Python version of you can. It's like, it's open source. Go for it, please. Yeah. Right. I, I'm not here to gatekeep anything. Um, if anything, we want it to, you know, you had mentioned uh, the bazaar earlier, right? We're still at the point right now where everything's very frothy and we want things to be, it's all set up to be flexible enough for the general mess of people trying new things and experimenting, right? Yeah. Um, and even, you know, bringing it back a little bit to the IPVM stuff, you know, open world, it should be able to handle people creating new task types that we've never seen before. But if somebody wants one of these and somebody, you know, can provide it, they should be able to connect together. You can, it's designed so that it's flexible enough that you can put in, as long as you can describe the capability, literally anything you want to do in there should should work, right? And if it doesn't, definitely open an issue, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll, uh, uh, you know, respond back or hop on a call or something yeah. uh, about that. Yeah. It's, fa I mean, I've genuinely seen people who I've watched go from turning up and you know at, at Noisebridge, the local hackerspace, and going, I need to do this, and me going, oh, have you seen this you can thing? To them you know, being fully involved in the thing because it, it, it's, it's almost exactly what they want or like they need to change something in how they think about things. So they need to talk to the experts and that the experts are, are right there. Um, I know as part of my learning journey, some of the, I mean, there'll be the strange loop talk, um, your, uh, the phishing, uh, um, community calls are like great. Like there are actual talks from people in this ecosystem and uh, also, uh, Boris would, would kill us if we didn't mention Causal Islands, right? Which is um, uh, a fishing adjacent um, uh, talk, There's uh, um, event. There's been one this year um, in the beautiful Pacific Northwest. And uh, is there one planned in the future or should people just treasure those videos? Uh, so, uh, yeah, in, in the spring, it was actually held in Toronto, um, yeah. and uh, that was the first one. It was very successful, um, and so there's a lot of interest in doing another one next year. So we're, we're kind, of, kind of looking around, um, you know, maybe London, maybe Brooklyn, New York. You know, we'll, 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 we'll see. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I uh, hope to see you there. And, uh, Brooke, thank you so much. That was a great Whistle Stop tour. Um, and if you're out there, um, there are lots of links to click on. And if you'd like to find out more about what's going on in the D web universe, of course, like we're, we're new, this is number one. So you should, you should subscribe immediately and tell all your friends and, you know, uh, rate us highly on all the evil centralized proprietary systems that store that property uh, metadata. Um, all right. Thanks very much. And, um, see you around. Great. Thank you so much for having me. All right.